Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our session. Our session, uh, the topic of our session is education. And uh, I'm very happy and glad uh, to be the moderator of this uh, interesting uh, panel. Uh, the new realities is the topic of the Delphi Forum. And of course, in our panel here, we're going to talk about education and uh, to see, to examine actually, if it is the right time because realities bring changes, if it is the right time to bring changes uh, and reforms in the Greek educational uh, system. So uh, I have the honor to introduce uh, Niki Kerameos. Niki Kerameos is the Minister of Education and Religious Affairs, elected member of uh, the Greek uh, Parliament with the New Democracy Party. Uh, she's a lawyer member of the Greek and uh, New York Bar Associations. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs is a uh, well-known economist. Uh, economics professor at Columbia University, director of the Center for S Sustainable Development at Columbia University, and president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I guess you two have met and worked together for the 4.7 uh, high-level advisory group at the United Nations eh, in different projects. Uh, but I guess education is one of them. So today I will start with a personal experience and story. Uh, my, I have two sons. My oldest son, Thanos, uh, is at the uh, 12th level. Uh, and uh, this year, he will give the Panhellenic exams. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to him. And uh, he was telling me with his friends how tough uh, the exams are and how obsolete the system is. And uh, I'm wondering, Niki uh, Kerameos, if this system is the system that could prepare students and Thanos for the future? Well, first of all, good afternoon to all. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Thanasiu. Good afternoon, Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, it is, uh, let me start off by saying that it's a true pleasure to uh, have, be having this discussion with both of you uh, and with uh, Jeff in particular, who is uh, a true global thinker, I would say, and uh, somebody who has assisted tremendously the international community in tackling very complex challenges. I have the privilege of serving uh, together with uh, Jeff on what we call the high-level advisory group of uh, Mission 4.7. And uh, we have both worked very closely um, uh, regarding transformative education and basically, and I'll jump right to the answer to your question, how um, can the education system prepare the youth for the challenges that lie ahead? And um, I, I firmly believe that when one is crafting now in 2022 education policy, one should have a look at the 2040 plus environment. So, 2040 plus environment. Why? Because take, for example, a, a child, a student that's now going to enter first grade, so six years old. He's going to finish more or less his student pathway um, uh, and enter the workforce roughly around 2040. Um, in 2040, I think it's really hard right now to predict what professions um, are, are going to be applicable, what jobs will be out there. So I think it becomes even more important to focus a lot on skills. And that's one of the emphasis we are placing as a government, as Ministry of Education, um, in responding to a question, what has to change? We are placing a lot of emphasis on enhancing skills. And when I say skills, I mean soft skills, critical thinking, empathy, problem solving, um, collaborative work, I mean digital skills, I mean language skills, so focusing a lot on skills, bearing in mind that the children who are now, for instance, in elementary school, are going to, in all likelihood, uh, be called upon to change several professions mm -hmm. when, they, when they grow up. Um, and they're going to have to adapt to a very fast changing world. So it becomes all the more important <laughs> aside from the main objective of education, which is transferring knowledge, to also cultivate skills. And that's something that uh, the SDG goals aim at. That's something that transformative education aims at. How do you enhance skills? Mm -hmm. And how do you do this in practice? For instance, you do it through the introduction of what we call the skills labs, which is a new uh, thematic in the mandatory school program uh, through themes such as um, uh, climate change, tackling climate change, through road safety, through sex education, through robotics and STEM. So new thematics that are introduced in the mandatory school program and aim at enhancing skills, focusing on skills, um, a more critical approach 
that uh, touches upon also the subject matters, and so I come to your son's case as well, um, and how the entire school system must adapt, it's important to adapt to this new way of thinking, um, and the approach always being having uh, in mind the future and what the expectations of our children will be for the future. How are we going to best equip our children to adapt the future? So focusing on skills, mm -hmm. focusing on uh, bringing closer education to the actual needs of society, uh, focusing on inclusion, how education can encompass and can provide equal opportunities to all, um, focusing also on greater autonomy of educational units and decentralizing the system, focusing on extroversion. I mentioned five pillars um, of five top priorities that we okay. have in order to render the mm -hmm. education how system. How far, uh, very quick, because I want to go to Professor Shaq, how far we are, we present this, you present this, an ideal educational system. How far are we from today in public schools? Look, a lot has been done. Um, it has to be, uh, we have to move forward with the implementation. We'll give you an example for each of the five. For instance, uh, focusing on skills. We have introduced the skills labs, which aim at exactly that. A uh, second example, uh, bringing closer education to the actual needs of the labor market. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, just a few days ago, Jeff, I was in Western Macedonia, in Kozani. Kozani is taking a lead in this transformative effort regarding focusing on renewable energies, um, on the delignatization process. There, in our vocation education institutes, we have incorporated specialties that have to do with new renewable energies, with technicians, for instance, for renewable energies. Why are we doing that? We're doing that in order to prepare the youth better for the needs of a society, the needs of the okay. economy, the needs of the job market. So that's an example of, um, of the second challenge. The third one, for instance, having to do with inclusion. How do we make sure that kids have equal opportunities? By ensuring that uh, kindergarten starts earlier on at the age of four, by ensuring that everybody has access to digital equipment, which is so necessary nowadays for mm -hmm. uh, also uh, this new transformative education we're presenting through the voucher system where we gave out to more than half a million students um, vouchers for the purchase of uh, technological equipment. Okay. The fourth one have, having to do with greater autonomy. So moving powers from uh, the central government, moving powers from the parliament to the schools, to the okay. educators, to the principals. Mm -hmm. And the fifth one having to do with extroversion. Uh, many of the challenges that um, Jeff and I discuss very often, for instance, climate change, are global challenges. And it's really important for the Greek education system to become more extrovert. Um, and that's another topic we're focusing on. I see a great representatives of the higher education sector here. And one of the topics we're focusing on is um, enhancing the position of our higher education institutes Important. in the world academic map. Um, very strong collaborations between our Greek universities with top universities from abroad. Columbia University, for instance, has a, a great collaboration with one of our top polytechnic schools. Okay. So just a few examples. Okay, I will get back to you. Uh, Professor Sachs, um, you have talked about the ancient university panepistimio and the values that brings. It's a strong brand anyway. Uh, you're familiar with the Greek educational system. What, what is the elements of reforms the Greek system you think needs in order to, to answer the needs of the kids in the future? I like everything uh, that I've heard uh, about the reforms that are underway. I think, speaking as an economist, I'll say one basic point, which is that investing in uh, your children and investing in what we call human capital, uh, the knowledge and the skills in this society, is by far the most important investment that a society makes. And that's not just a cliche or to sound nice. If you actually graph investments in human capital versus economic growth, the fit is very, very clear. If you look at why the East Asian economies have soared in the last 40 years, they're at the top of these test scores, for example. There's an international comparative test score uh, called PISA, which is a process that the OECD runs for about 70 countries. The East Asian countries are at the top of the list. That's why they're absorbing technology faster and growing faster. So I'd say to your son, study hard, don't complain, get good grades. Uh, th this is uh, 
one, one piece. So investing in top educational skills matters. Now, saying this in Greece is uh, so saying something that was understood already 2,400 years ago. And I think it's important. Athens was the center of world knowledge for centuries and centuries. You invented academia, literally. So the academy is a Greek invention. The paideia is a Greek invention. That there's proper learning in order to be a good citizen. Aristotle devoted much of the politics and the Nicomachean ethics to education. Because he said, without education, you can't have good citizens. Without good citizens, you can't have a good polis. So this is a Greek idea from the core. I think also it is completely right for the 21st century, not only if you have skilled young people in Greece, which I'm sure these reforms are going to bring about, not only will that by itself be part of uh, Greece's economic success and sustainable development success. But frankly, it's hard to think of another place in the world, literally in the world, where students would rather come than come to Greece to study. So you should open up the higher education so that everybody's coming to get a little bit of Aristotle, a little bit of Plato, a little bit of, uh, of Aristophanes, a little bit of modern artificial intelligence studies, a little bit of renewable energy technology, because this is the perfect place. I want to come back to study in school, OK? I've been, uh, you know, it's, it's been a while. Uh, I won't tell you how long. <laughs> but anyway, when I come back from my next degree, I want it to be in Greece. Okay. So th this is uh, okay. so, now, But if I could just say yes. one, one more sure. thing, just to sure. explain what this mission 4.7 is very briefly uh, that uh, Minister Karameos and I are working on. We have sustainable development goals, 17 of them. SDG 4 is quality education for everybody. It should be a no-brainer, but I'll tell you, there are hundreds of millions of kids not in school in the world. Our world is cruel to leave any child without an education, and there are hundreds of millions of kids that don't have an education. So I just want to remind us of that. It's cruel. It's stupid. But we're doing it. But Mission 4.7 is about one target of SDG 4. Target 4.7 says every learner should learn about the world, about sustainable development, about climate change, about the environment, and about global citizenship. So another good Greek word, cosmopolitan, being a member of the world, of the cosmos, a citizen of the world, that is what Mission 4.7 is. So it's about a long horizon in time and also in space. One of the reasons why there's killing underway nearby is that we don't help people to understand across cultures. We, as soon as a conflict comes, we're so tribal. They're all evil, we're all good. And you hear that no matter what side you're on. And then the fighting continues until Pyrrhic victory someplace, which means no victory at all, of course. And so we need to educate about the reality of world cultures, tolerance, uh, openness, extroversion to the world. Values, we need to educate values. That was a very good idea of Aristotle. And we need to educate in terms of virtues as well. So that's what Mission 4.7 is. And your minister is one of the world leaders in that. So is Pope Francis, UNESCO. It's a wonderful opportunity to help spread the idea that we need to help educate skills, knowledge, and virtues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Minister Kermeos, what is the obstacle 
for reforms, for more reforms in the university. That's an excellent idea. Uh, everybody knows that if you offer, let's say, 50 or 100 positions in Harvard or Columbia for students, everybody will come to Athens and, uh, or at Aristotle University and study, whatever. Uh, but what's the obstacle to, to reforms, to, to get uh, the universities more market-oriented? You propose a law. Uh, can you tell us a few elements of how uh, the new education system will be more market-oriented? Right. Um, so for the past two and a half years, we have undertaken a number of uh, reforms in order to render our universities more extrovert and um, also uh, to bring them closer to the actual needs of society and the labor market. Um, you mentioned first uh, internationalization and how um, it's, it's important for our universities to form partnerships with others. Um, and I must say that for the past two and a half years and before, of course, but our universities are working extremely hard to form such partnerships. We did our duty, which was to render the regime as flexible as possible. That was done. So now universities can craft freely um, foreign language programs. Um, I, I, I see in front of me the rector of the University of Thessaloniki. We have the first English-speaking med school in Greece. There were 60 positions offered. There were over a thousand interested mm -hmm. uh, students from across the globe, <laughs> from around the globe. So that shows, and that was within COVID, right? Within the context of COVID. Um, same thing, University of Athens, uh, other universities as well. Uh, I see the rector of the Polytechnic School. Uh, they have a fantastic partnerships with, partnership with Columbia. So uh, a, number of reform, a number of such partnerships are now being formed uh, with top universities in the U.S., but beyond the U.S. also, the United Kingdom, um, uh, China, etc. Um, how do you bring universities closer to the actual needs of society? Right now, we have a piece of legislation that's um, uh, getting ready to go into public consultation. A, a significant segment of such legislation pertains exactly to the issue you raised. How do you bring closer universities to the labor market? I'll give you a couple of examples. First, through, through practical training. Through, so um, giving incentives to both students and universities mm -hmm. to focus more on practical training, um, uh, uh, giving credits concrete credits depending on the duration of the practical training to students doing practical training, um, uh, providing for minimum compensation, providing for, um, uh, for other benefits for those doing practical training. Uh, another example, industrial PhDs. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing PhDs in the abstract, rather uh, tackling a concrete challenge of the industry. I mentioned the renewable energies before. One of the major the issues idea. is waste disposal. What do you do about waste disposal in the context of renewable energies? There is a fantastic topic for a PhD candidate to focus on. So industrial PhDs is in the new legislation, a complete regime regarding industrial PhDs. And in fact, is, there is a very significant financing from the RRP package um, on industrial PhDs. Um, so there too, there's another example of how do you bring closer uh, universities with the actual needs um, of society um, and the labor market. Mm -hmm. Mentioning uh, Mr. Papayuan, uh, uh, personally, I got a master's degree last year in an English program uh, <coughs> about communication and journalism, an excellent <coughs> program where students from the United States and Europe uh, were participating. Uh, some, some critics, though, uh, Minister Karameos, uh, say that is it the right time for reforms because these reforms that you when I push, uh, they always uh, have reactions. Is it the right time to push this kind of reforms that, you know, the Greek system, everybody agrees that need, are needed? Mr. Pathanasiou, this government and this Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, have been elected to do reforms. That has been the mandate that the Greek people gave to Kyriakos Mitsotakis. And we have followed in education a bottom-up approach. What do I mean? We started from the bottom, from um, the most crucial years of kindergarten, and we have moved our way up uh, to universities. So we have passed legislation on kindergartens, on elementary school, on junior and senior high school, on the Panhellenic exams, uh, on vocational education and training, and now we're moving following up on other efforts we have done in the uh, uh, higher education field. Now, this is one uh, significant piece of legislation, I would say, providing a holistic framework 
for higher education. Um, to answer your question, it's always time for reforms. Okay. And I really think that society demands reforms. Let me give you an example. One of the, um, one of the uh, issues we have included in the, in the new piece of legislation is what we call the Greek Erasmus program. So what does that mean? The possibility for a, Greek, for a student who's, for instance, in uh, architecture to be able to go for a semester and follow a fine arts class. Um, things that happen abroad for which there's no possibility to a large extent today, uh, I think are no-brainers, quite frankly. And I think that society is demanding that we give more opportunities, more flexibility to both our students and to our universities. Another example, uh, joint and double degrees uh, leading to, uh, you know, to two diplomas um, that uh, are provided for in this new piece of legislation between two or more departments of the same university or of uh, different universities. Mm -hmm. So these are opportunities that I think, um, you know, we have to move fast. Um, we are um, uh, approaching the end of our third year um, of, of our term. Uh, as I said, we have passed the majority of the reforms we promised the Greek people. Uh, there's one uh, coming up which, uh, to which we grant tremendous importance, but to answer your question, uh, this government has a mandate to do reforms. Uh, so we're absolutely um, determined to push forward and to push forward in order to give more opportunities to our universities, more opportunities to our students. Okay, Professor Sachs, I guess uh, you, you would like to go through, uh, actually these reforms to go through so you can come and teach in Athens. <laughs> economics and uh, uh, the sciences. Uh, what is the trends worldwide in, in, in the States as well um, with the new technologies for the university of the future that only brings knowledge but also shapes the values of the society? I think the uh, values question is an open question. Nobody has demonstrated <coughs> the kind of breakthroughs that we need on values, I would say. What I think is interesting on the technology side, though, is we all have seen in the last two years uh, what online education means. We were thrown into it uh, rather amazingly, I would say, universities and schools all, all the way to uh, lower school level, primary school level, within a week or two figured out how to do online education. My feeling is that will never go away, and this now needs to be absolutely wrapped around lifetime learning and new ways of education. Classrooms are fine. Global classrooms are also good online. Uh, all the, all the uh, online possibilities that allow for continuing education, certificate degrees, more flexible learning, special workshops. We now have a chance, in a way that was not true three or four years ago, to have a lifetime where you're always learning something in a more systematic way. So I think there will be weekend mini degrees and there will be certificates and there will be a, a new universe of uh, certification, but training, testing, uh, like your son is going through, and so on, that will enrich how we actually do education. For, for 2,000 years, there wasn't much advance in educational technology, actually. Uh, professors walked, starting with the, the peripatetic school. They walked behind the professor, tried to hear what he was saying. Someone took notes. Uh, and this is how it was by the time I uh, started school, uh, university, 50 years ago, this year, actually, which is Would a little strange. the traditional way or the, the new trends? And I think everything changed in, mm -hmm. in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, and I think for the good. I often, I mean, now it's trivially true, but I, I've been doing it for the last 15 years. I often have classes where there are 30 campuses from around the world online. 15 years ago, I started teaching 8 a.m. in New York, 8 p.m. in Beijing, and everything in between. It left out Australia and California, it's true, but there was a 12-hour time zone in which we could have 25 or 30 campuses talking together about climate change or environmental. We need to now invent all sorts of interesting things. 
the, the reason why the minister is completely right about skills rather than very specific tracks is the advance of technology, not only in the digital access, but in what machines can do, what artificial intelligence will do, what robots will do, means that the jobs are going to be so different 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. You better run ahead of the machine a little bit so that the machine is your friend, not replacing you entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means that uh, we're absolutely in a new era where the most of the mechanical, physical jobs are really going to be replaced by robots. Okay. And that's fine. And, uh, but humans now have to do the human side. I say go back to Aristotle. He had a lot of good ideas about that. Athens can again be center for the world for how we should teach, the values okay. question, okay. and the future. Okay, what do you prefer though? The online uh, teaching, the, the way you mention it, or coming to Athens to an uh, amphitheater uh, teaching Aristotle? I like a little of both, <laughs> but I, I like the fact I'm envisioning a course that I want to teach where students from around the world can listen to people at the Delphi archaeological site okay. live, walking around now with a Zoom. Oh my God, that's a, you know, I've read about uh, the Oracle, but now I see it live and there's someone I can ask a question to. This is something that could not have been done five, ten years ago, but we can invent new ways okay. of teaching now that are wonderful. We we'll have almost uh, three, year, uh, three minutes uh, left. Uh, let's go to your field. Uh, as you mentioned, you both, that um, uh, education promoted actually globalization. Uh, the crisis, this crisis promoted the globalization. Uh, but uh, how about the war in Ukraine, your field? Uh, do you think, uh, talk, and talk to us about the effects of the war in Ukraine, in the world uh, economies. Do you think there are a risk for inflation for the European economies? And what, uh, do you agree with the assessment of Paul Krugman who said that Putin might put an end to the world economy as we know it today and put an end to the globalization? Did he really say that? That's stupid. Okay. That's wrong. No, actually, he, 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 he questioned. I don't know what he said, he, but he, that's wrong. Okay. We should, first of all, we should end this war. It can be ended. All the statements, this war changes everything. This war is unlike anything. This war is an existential, this war, mm -hmm. this is wrong. Let's stop the hyperbole, stop the fighting, get Russia to go home, which it will, have Ukraine become neutral so that we're not having two empires against each other, which is what this war is really about in the end. Russia wants its empire, NATO wants its empire. How about a little space between them and this war never would have taken place? And instead of all the hyperbole, which is gonna drive us crazy, because we really are tribal if we fall into this trap. We will blow each other up unless we say, this is crazy, stop, both sides, mm -hmm. okay. go home. So I just want to say it doesn't change everything and we shouldn't end globalization and we shouldn't end the idea. Russia's still going to be there, by the way. Russia's been involved on the borders of, okay. uh, of uh, these wars for Okay, uh, so I, go to I just want to make a point. Uh, Let's end the war, okay. not uh, talk about the change of everything. Great. Uh, risks for the economy? Uh, uh, for the, uh, the economy? The longer the war goes on, the more pain. If the Americans have their way, the war will go on a long time because Americans love long wars. They think the war in Afghanistan, they started it 40 years ago. Okay, that's fine, it wasn't on our territory, the war in Syria. Americans don't mind perpetual wars on someone else's okay. territory. So, just to say, Europe will suffer unless this war is stopped. So Europe should not fall into the trap okay. of escalation, it falling, should end the war. Are we falling into the trap? Uh, because we already <laughs> see the 
effects in the Greek uh, economy. Uh, and does the uh, government, Mitsotakis government, does enough to relieve the people? First of all, we're talking about an illegal war. We're talking about the violation of a sovereign state. Uh, Greece has, and the EU, has fully condemned this war from the very beginning. I do too. <laughs> we're, we're talking about tremendous consequences on, uh, you know, regarding people's lives. We have seen uh, the, the, uh, really horrific images, which one would never expect to see in 2022 uh, and in Europe. And yes, it has uh, important consequences, which touch upon every country, and of course, Greece as well. Uh, especially aside from the tremendous loss uh, of, of, human gap, of, of, of humans, which is the number one uh, uh, horrific loss. In addition, there are very important consequences on the energy field. Um, and that's why this government has uh, and is doing everything in its power. We have given over four billion, roughly four billion euros in support um, of, uh, of, in a targeted fashion, primarily in support of those in need. Uh, so as to alleviate some of the effects of this, uh, of, of this energy crisis. But of course, the EU has to act um, over and above what each member state is doing. And that's why we have undertaken efforts, and our prime minister has undertaken efforts, in order for the EU to take united action, uh, just like we did in other fields, for instance, when uh, negotiating the purchase of vaccines altogether uh, as European Union. Uh, so no one member state can solve this problem. We as Greece are doing everything in our power uh, um, to alleviate the effects, some of the effects of this um, uh, energy crisis, uh, but the EU has to act united on this front as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Minister Kerameos, Professor Sachs, thank you so much for your participation. Uh, it was, I really enjoyed the discussion with you. Uh, interesting comments. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, here we come to an end. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.